<clears throat> and here we go. Hangout is on air live. It's Cecil Lammy and Dr. Gene Bramble is the last little bit of vacation sneak in as Matt Waldman and Sigmund Bloom are on assignment. Dr. Gene, even though it's July 19th, we actually have a couple of teams that have reported. Yeah, Baltimore and Chicago are both in. If the NFL's communication was correct, Baltimore's rookies reported a couple of weeks ago. I don't remember that specifically, but got a couple in. Everybody else comes in next Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So, yeah, the last little bit of vacation indeed. And then the long, slow grind of attrition all the way through January <laughs> begins. Here we go to the regular season it is. And to Dr. Gene Bramble, of course, you check out his work at footballguys.com and follow him on Twitter at Gene Bramble. Is the Allen Robinson story really a story with the Bears uh, reporting and Robinson there, uh, you know, and, and feeling great according to reports? Yeah, I think I think that is the story is that he's not started on PUP list. And we'll talk about this a lot more next Thursday night once we know kind of what's happening Wednesday, Thursday, and maybe even with some of the teams reporting on Friday, who may start camp not on the active roster. Um, and there's always a little bit of worry about who starts on the active roster, who doesn't. And if they start on the PUP list, is that something we need to be concerned about? And we'll probably go back and forth about some of those situations. Some of them will be more meaningful than others. Some players just won't be in condition yet and need a couple of days to pass a physical. But it's always a good sign when players don't start on the PUP list and they're cleared, they pass a physical and start on the active roster. And that says that the team really doesn't have any concern that there might be a little bit of a hiccup and that they've closed the door on being able to use that PUP slot as camp ends if something should happen. So the fact that Robinson's been cleared to practice, they may bring him in a little bit slowly. There doesn't appear to be an indication of that, but all of these players that start on the active roster should be expected to practice pretty quickly, even if they manage some of the practice reps early on. So it's nice to see Robinson ready to to go. I think that was the expectation. But again, teams don't have to tell you anything from OTAs through minicamp to now. And now is really the first indication of what teams think about their injured players. Can they pass physicals? Are they in condition? Are we going to have to worry about uh, players starting on the active roster? So good sign for Allen Robinson, but no, probably not a huge story. Well, let's talk about a guy before we jump to the Ravens side of things. Uh, let's talk about a former bear. And Cameron Meredith, who is hopeful for training camp, uh, missed all the 2017 season due to the torn ACL and slight MCL tear. He's been working rigorously to come back from. And Meredith saying, you know, I'm gaining strength day by day, month by month. I'm excited to see how soon I can get back. But the main objective for me is to do as much as I can with the trainers to get ready for the season. My goal is to try to get back to training camp. As long as there aren't any setbacks or anything like that, it shouldn't be a problem. It's exciting to think about Meredith in the Saints passing game, catching passes from Drew Brees will do wonders for your fantasy value, Dr. Gene. And, well, Michael Thomas isn't going to catch everything, is he? Uh, what, what do we know about Cameron Meredith with the Saints yet to report, but soon to get to training camp? Right, and I think this is going to be one of those player situations where is this player speak and there's really no concern, or is there maybe a little bit more going on? When the Saints signed Meredith, everything we've heard has been positive through the offseason. He was able to do some stuff, um, some individual drills and OTAs, and the expectation was that he'd be ready. The way that sounds, I don't have any reason to expect that he did suffer a setback, but again, he's got to come in and pass a physical. The team probably hasn't seen him in at least four weeks since the early June mini camp, maybe a little bit longer than that, so he needs to prove that he's in condition and not at risk. His injury was early last year in September, but it involved, it was more than one ligament. It involved that MCL as well, which always prolongs the rehab a little bit. Um, but the expectation was that he should be ready for camp. And, you know, it seems like he's kind of hedging there a little bit, but I think the expectation for Meredith would be that he's ready to go. It is the Audible Live. Dr. Gene Bramble and Cecil Lammy here on Thursday night. Sig and Matt on assignment this evening. And let's get to Baltimore's. Ken Dixon, someone people are keeping track of. I want to ask you about Mandrew. Mark Andrews, of course, their rookie tight end. One of two. They've got Hayden Hurst there as well as they look for, you know, kind of new. It's it's all about new weapons for Joe Flacco in the passing game and those wide receivers. I got some thoughts coming up a little bit later in the show. But let's talk about Kenneth Dixon, that backfield. And Dr. Gene, anything on Mark Andrew, who is missing time with a soft tissue injury. That's on our Football Guys Newswire. 
Yeah, I don't think we're going to get too much information on that you know, until the team releases some things there. Uh, it's not really clear how long he's been banged up a little bit. Again, another player that is there a little bit more of an aggravation going on than we expected? Something more happened since the end of minicamp? Or is this, again, conditioning is an issue. They want to make absolutely sure that he can pass a physical and a conditioning test before they put him on the active roster. So not likely to be an issue. But again, there's always surprises one way or the other as we start camp. Um, Dixon, another player that, you know, was an early injury in July, but because they repaired the meniscus and sewed it back together rather than just kind of trimmed it up and did a cleanup procedure, it turned what is sometimes a three to six week recovery into a four to six month recovery. Uh, and with the Ravens, you know, struggling at times last year, even if he was close to being ready, it probably didn't make much sense to bring him back. He was participating in off-season activities without too much difficulty uh, and was fully expected to be ready for camp. So it would have been a surprise if he started on the PUP list and would have been a big reason for concern. So what we're watching for there now is what kind of reps is he getting? Where is he in the rotation? Are they managing his practice situation at all? And if they're not, then we just see where he's on the depth chart, and that all inform us is what kind of chances he has to, to be a little bit more productive with Alex Collins there and others this year. We are waiting with bated breath, Dr. Gene, and just basically one more thing before I let you out of here for tonight. Appreciate your time and jumping on the show. Uh, everyone waiting with bated breath over any Andrew Luck, anything, or Carson Wentz as well, with Doug Peterson having uh, some comments about his young franchise quarterback. Yeah, Doug Peterson told reporters he just kind of deferred to the medical staff. I think he's figured at this point that he's going to get questions about this, how much Wentz is practicing, whether he takes a day off. I think that the plan all along is for Philadelphia's medical staff, along with Wentz and the coaches as well, to have a sense of uh, how much he's able to do and whether or not he's going to be able to participate at all in preseason games and then maybe week one. And that's the goal. Week one is the goal. And we're still a good, you know, 45, 50 days away from that happening for Philadelphia, even though they've got the Thursday night game. Um, so Peterson just said, you know, I'm deferring to the medical staff. We're going to let them make those decisions. And I think that's a, a pretty reasonable approach for Philadelphia to take. Andrew Luck, you know, this time last year, we had started to get more and more and more concerned that he wasn't throwing. We hadn't heard anything since the middle of June. We were talking about, is he going to start on PUP? Is he not? And I think we were all a little bit reassured when he didn't, because that made the suggestion that the Colts, you know, as we talked about a little bit earlier in the show, had every intention or every expectation of him being of luck being able to come back and play before week six of the season. And obviously it was, you know, a much different outcome that we saw. But this year, um, we've seen him throw. He's been a little bit more uh, forthcoming with the media in these last couple of weeks. And it will be a surprise if anything other than Andrew Luck at least doing seven on seven work in a non contact jersey as camp starts. If anything other than that happens, we're back into the whirlpool and the maelstrom of what in the world is going on as cramp starts. So I think both of these guys are going to be on the active roster. Maybe, maybe we see Wentz start on PUP. But as of right now, given what they did toward the end of OTAs and minicamp in June, if they're not on the active roster, then I think we're going to have to have a hard conversation about if it's meaningful. And we're kind of on a day-to-day, week-to-week watch after that. But I expect them to be ready to go next week. Is it a whirlpool or a cesspool? <laughs> it, well, it, it, it's could very quickly become a cesspool, especially if Jim Irsay gets involved and, and try to, to talk through the media. If Andrew Luck is not ready, it would get ugly in a big old hurry if mm -hmm. that's not the case. Well, and watch for the PUP thing because it could give the Eagles a, a bit of an out because PUP at the beginning of camp, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Gene, means You're you correct. can be PUP at the beginning of the regular season. That's if right. you are not on PUP at the beginning of camp, you cannot be on PUP at the beginning of the regular season. That is right. So, so it, if you start on the active roster, mm -hmm. when yeah. if you're on the active roster after the league season, well, that's not really perfectly accurate either because I'm using semantics there. But um, if you start camp on the active roster, you can only do injured reserve afterwards. And there's two types of NFI injured reserve and PUP. There's active and reserve. And there are going to be some players that are put on the reserve PUP list, which means um, you know, or the reserve whatever that they're they're pretty much done for those six to eight weeks until the season starts. Most of these players, uh, and Marshall Yanda is really the only one so far, um, although he wasn't on the, that's an interesting thing, between Field Yates and a couple other folks reported that he was on the PUP list, but it's not on the transactions list yet. He is reportedly on the active PUP list, which means he can come off at any point, um, and then they have the ability to transfer him to the reserve PUP list toward the end of the year. So um, that's what we're looking for, who's got what when. Um, but uh, it, you're right, it, it just leaves options open. It's not 
it hasn't been used as heavily in the last couple of years because the league roster is at 90. So it's a little bit easier to, to float some players in the beginning of the year where, you know, they're not in condition anyway. But if the team thinks there's any chance at all that they won't be able to start the season um, or miss a couple of weeks into the regular season, usually they leave those options open. I know it would create kind of a, not necessarily a PR nightmare, but certainly a lot of buzz, but shouldn't the Eagles just throw them on PUP? I mean, give no, themselves I, that opportunity just in case. Maybe, but if they've seen enough from him, he did more in minicamp than they expected him to do. And if he did but not we're have not any- talking about an August knee injury, you know, this isn't like tw- we've got 12 months. Like, what, what was it? Correct. But I think remember? they're, they're going to want to put him in situations. And again, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, when are they reporting? It doesn't have to be July 25th, next Wednesday, when they make that decision. So if there's any thought that, um, you know, it might stretch on, but even. Once, even if he's not ready for week one, there really hasn't been, and there shouldn't be any indication unless he has a setback, which would occur in practice or, or another. You wouldn't expect it when he's not um, doing active things there. Um, you know that that he he would be available before week four to six. So if he's not quite ready in week one, I think Nick Foles would have to be playing tremendously well to keep Carson Wentz on the bench into week seven, eight anyway. So, um, you know, if there's really no expectation for him to be put on the PU plea list and you're planning on putting him out there in seven on sevens and seeing how he does so that you can take those extra four to six weeks to condition and mentally recondition and get him prepared for week one, um, then I, I, I wouldn't be disappointed if I were an Eagles fan. I would and be scared that well they put him. I think that's a very good sign that the Eagles trust him and the medical staff enough to navigate through these six to seven weeks of training camp to get him into week one successfully. He is Dr. Gene Brammel. You follow him on Twitter at Gene Brammel and read his reports at footballguys.com. Dr. Gene, namaste, kind sir. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. We get in these last couple of days and then we're going to be back on the grind for sure. So I may have a haircut next time you see me. <laughs> I'm trying to be like uh the, the guy from Ancient Aliens. So mm-hmm. there you go. It's aliens. Good luck with that. Story. There you go. Dr. Gene, right. be good, baby. See you. All right. There we have him. Dr. Gene Bramlett. It is the Audible Live. And a reminder from one of our sponsors, of course, the FFPC. You've been kicking butt in your local leagues for years. Will this be the year you take the next step and start winning some real cash? Take your talents to the FFPC, the home of season-long fantasy football with leagues and contests to fit all budgets and interest. If you can't get enough of best ball format, the FFPC has you covered with best ball drafts starting at $35 all the way up to $1,250 entry fees. Multiple drafts are filling each and every day, so you don't have to wait forever for a league to fill. For those of you looking to join a new startup dynasty league, the FFPC now has over 250 dynasty leagues with new startups filling throughout the preseason. And Want to hear something incredible? Not a single FFPC Dynasty League has ever folded in nine years. That is fantastic. FFPC Dynasty Leagues are full of serious and active owners. Brand new startup Dynasty Leagues are forming right now, starting at $77 entry, going all the way up to $2,500 per team. Don't miss the FFPC experience, my friends. Join your fellow players today and go to myffpc.com. That's myffpc.com. FFPC, the home of season-long high-stakes fantasy football. Well, it's just you and me, baby. (laughs) So let's do this. Uh, With about 40 minutes left in tonight's show, I'm going to be taking some of your questions from the chat room, reacting to me, and going over some of the news and notes. Um, For those that don't know, every day uh, I write the Football Guys newswire and and newsletter that Joe Bryant compiles. Sigmund covers it a couple of days. Andrew Garda covers it one day per week during the regular season. Uh, But join our our free daily newsletter because you have a life. We don't. (laughs) Let us look over the stories, give you the Football Guys view and that take. By the way, when Dr. Gene was talking about Carson Wentz, my mind was constantly going towards Nate Sudfeld because I just want to see more of Nate Sudfeld in in the preseason. And that's a dynasty, deep dynasty, super nerdy alert. But yeah, that's, you know, we, we know what Nick Foles can do and can do quite well, I might add. Uh, we need to see what they can get from Nate Sudfeld, a player that they really like, of course, from Indiana. They stole him away from Washington. He was a kid that uh, a few years ago at the Shrine game, I was actually considering going to LA instead of Tampa. I was going to go to the NFL PA game instead of Tampa in the shrine game. Like I have for, you know, over 12 years now, 
I instead, I, I decided to stick with Tampa. And I'm glad I did because Nate Sudfeld was there. And so this is a guy that I've had um, an, an affinity for for uh, a while. So it's good to see the what he can do this preseason and see if the Eagles' uh, belief in him pay off. Now, that's super deep dynasty. Uh, you know, not a lot of people with their hot Nate Sudfeld takes right now. So taking your questions. And it does not have to be uh, a Broncos question, but I have a couple of Broncos questions here uh, tonight. Ben saying, what's up, football guy family? <laughs> and Tim saying, three paychecks for Cecil. Yeah, hey, I'll take it. Booker versus Freeman. How do you see it playing out? This one's coming in from Nicholas. Again, get your questions out of the chat room. Uh, I'm going to talk about Jordan Matthews. I'm going to talk about the Green Bay running back situation. I'm also going to talk about uh, the situation in Indianapolis. Our very own Daniel Simpkins with a, a great article at footballguys.com. But let's talk Booker versus Freeman. This is going to come down to pads. This is going to be week two or week three of the preseason. We will only get hints. We will not know. Next week, next Friday, I will be out at the media barbecue for the Denver Broncos talking to John Elway, Vance Joseph, Joe Ellis, probably Vaughn Miller, and maybe Demarius Thomas. They always throw a couple of players. And then Saturday, it is on. I will be reporting for you. Make sure to follow on Twitter. Make sure to listen to the show. We've got the preseason watch list, which start at the end of July and into August into training camp the preseason. So when you look at these two backs, Devontae Booker is a great receiver. Now, regularly, I don't praise Devontae Booker because 3.6 yards per carry over two years is not fantastic. This was the guy that, let me, let me put it this way, <laughs> the best way I can. Little birdies have told me that team was ready to take Devontae Booker in the first round had they not been able to move up and get Paxton Lynch. Now, you've seen what happened with Paxton, Mr. Fortnite expert, but not a great football player. Uh, but that's how highly this team thought of Devontae Booker. I had a second round grade on him. I would not have taken him in the first round that year. And he's been a huge disappointment. He's been a huge letdown uh, because for me personally, I think he's blind. I, I think as a runner, he doesn't have the vision that you need. Whenever I've talked to Terrell Davis, we always have this back and forth, very playful banter between me and TD, Hall of Famer Terrell Davis, about, you know, is it vision or is it footwork? What's more important for a running back? And I just like to argue with TD, but but we have that discussion. He said, you know, when he took handoffs, he was looking at the safeties. He was looking at the third level. He wasn't worried about the second level and the running backs. And it is vision. For me, if you can see it, you don't have the feet to get there. It doesn't matter. Footwork is, is what matters. Well, Booker doesn't have the feet and he doesn't have the vision. He's a swift inline runner, meaning he's a gap runner. If you give him a lane and say, Devante, run right here, right now, as fast as you can, a hole's going to be there. He can do it. He's got build up speed and build up power. He can leap over small children in a single bound, like all these things for Devante Booker. But guess what they're doing? They're going back to his own blocking system in Denver. Zone concepts, which of course Royce Freeman knows well, Rolls Royce knows well from his days at Oregon and the zone concepts they use up there in the Northwest. So with Devonta Booker, this is a team that that's loved him, right? And they're loyal to their draft picks to a fault. You know, Jeff Hireman, uh, Paxton Lynch, even just still being on the roster uh, after the joke performances that we've seen from him and incredibly disappointing. Don't go, don't get me off track. But with Devonta Booker, I, I will note this. I've been around Vance Joseph. I stand right next to him on his left side uh, at every press conference. Every single stand-up that he's had, I'm right there, right next to him. I've read his body language. It doesn't mean everything, but it might mean something. When I talk to him at the scouting combine, usually you bring up Devontae Booker, and he's like this. Now, recently, whether it's combine, minicamp, OTAs, whenever I've talked to Vance Joseph about Devontae Booker, he's a little bit more cold if you will. Again, could mean something, could mean nothing, but just know as someone who's been around Vance Joseph for a year and been closer to him than anybody in a literal sense, uh, he doesn't seem as warm about Devonte Booker. He's really excited about Royce Freeman. I think he should be. I mean, it's a make or break year for Vance Joseph. So with Royce Freeman, it's going to come down to week two or week three of the preseason, and it's going to come down to pass protection. Does this team protect Case Keenum well? The offensive line has huge question marks. Jared Veld here and Ron Leary did not practice at all in OTAs or minicamp. So there's big time questions there. And then when you look at what's going on at the running back position, well, do you trust Booker in pass pro? Do you trust Royce Freeman in pass pro? And, and to praise Booker, 
He has great hands. He's a great receiver. He's got soft hands. You know, he's swift after the catch. Like I said, that play against the Colts got called back by a Garrett Bowles penalty. Shocker. Garrett Bowles was called for a penalty. Most heavily penalized left tackle in all of football. But, you know, he, he leaped over a Colts defender on a sideline off of a screen pass. So, you know, we've seen that type of athleticism from Devonta Booker. And he is the best receiver on this team as far as a receiving back. But he's not the best runner. And, and with them going back to zone concepts, I believe this is Royce Freeman's job as soon as they possibly can. Meaning, if Royce Freeman shows them he can work in pass protection, and that's what I'll be watching mostly with Royce Freeman, especially in training camp, and especially when they don't have pads or they're doing limited contact, like, you can't get anything from linebackers or running backs when there's no live tackling to the ground. So what I'm going to be watching is backs on backers really closely for Royce Freeman. Because if he can do it, or if they can trust him, if they get, say, we can believe in this guy to protect Case Keenum, you know, the greatest asset they picked up this offseason was a actual real quarterback, not the, f- you know, fake Messiah Trevor Simeon and not Paxton Lynch, who spends more time on Xbox than he does in his playbook. So, you know, does he protect Case Keenum? If he does, he's the guy. He's running back two upside because this is a team that wants to feature that one guy they want one to know there will be a, a, a backup there will be someone that comes in when someone needs a breather okay that's every team but just know there is running back two upside there for whoever that is i don't think it's going to be booker i think it's going to be freeman but we're going to watch this one closely in training camp i guarantee you on saturday next saturday not this upcoming saturday two days but a week from now so nine days from now when training camp starts, Devontae Booker will be the first team running back. I pretty much can guarantee you that because they're going to make Royce Freeman earn that job. And again, they're loyal to their draft picks, even if it's loyal to a fault. So Freeman versus versus Booker, I'm going to put my chips on Freeman. I'm going to, of course, be out there every day, standing on the sidelines, watching practice, reporting for you right here on Twitter, on the Audible Live, on the regular Audible. Make sure to subscribe on iTunes. Thank you. We love you. Good night. Not yet. Got about a half hour left in tonight's show. So taking your questions from the chat room. So chat room, keep reacting to me and and we'll get this thing going. But like I said, I I wanted to mention a few things because the off season, there's the lazy analysis that says, oh, well, the off season, that doesn't matter. What are this mini camp reports? Bunch of fluff, right? Uh, It's a bunch of, no, no, no. You're listening for drum beats. There is fluff. Of course there's fluff. There's reporters trying to do their job when not much is going on. What the do you think that is? It's fluff. But there's also some truth to the matter if you're listening to people that you trust. I trust Mike Reese. Now, longtime listeners of the Audible will remember that Mike Reese was on this show when it did our beat writer tour. And Mike Reese came on the Audible years and years ago and started telling us about this guy named Wes Welker. Years ago, when he had picked up by the New England Patriots away from the Miami Dolphins, hey, San Diego Chargers, you had him on your team too. Way to go, Chargers. Uh, but it was Mike Reese, then from ESPN Boston. I think it was ESPN Boston still at that time. ESPN.com. Everybody knows Mike Reese. He is the most reliable source for Patriots information that you could possibly have. And he was talking about Wes Welker on this show years ago, before anybody else. So it was cool to kind of have that inside information back then. And and this is years ago. The Audible has been around since 2006, baby. So one, it means we're old. Two, it means, well, you know, it wasn't as prevalent. You know, the information wasn't as out there as it is right now. But it was really cool to have Mike Reese on the show talking about Wes Welker. Guess what he's been talking about recently? Jordan Matthews. Jordan Matthews is a player that during Julian Edelman's suspension, you could see put up at least flex worthy numbers. I mean, right now with Jordan Matthews, he's going off the board at wide receiver 59 at 13, 10 in 12 team PPRs, meaning that at the end of the 13th round, he's getting, he's getting drafted near the end of the draft. People are going, Oh, screw it. Give me Jordan Matthews. Well, know that the production has been there. He's a wide receiver too. his first two years in the league, nearly a thousand yards receiving in each season. Uh, eight touchdowns. I think he had 16 touchdowns his first two years, eight and eight. Math is difficult. But yeah, Jordan Matthews, we've seen it before. Now, last year in Buffalo, was anything 
not named LaShawn McCoy for fantasy owners good in Buffalo. Uh, by the way, the Josh Allen reports like keep him third string. If that team doesn't have LaShawn McCoy and they got nobody to throw to, like, yeah, don't don't ruin Josh Allen from day one, Buffalo. Get it right with the guy and get some weapons around and we'll see what happens with the McCoy situation. Getting off track, getting back on track to talk about Jordan Matthews. Now, what's the drum beat? What's the off-season drum beat? It has been consistent about Jordan Matthews showing good chemistry with Tom Brady, showing good connection, showing you know, rejuvenation, any sort of what just look up Jordan Matthews, go down the newswire of what's been reported about him this spring and into the summer. And you see the consistent drum beat from the guy that you can trust the most when it comes to the Patriots. And that's Mike Reese. So message, guess what? In every single draft, when I get to the last few rounds, I'm going to take Jordan Matthews in every single draft that I'm in. Why? Because the first month of the season, and I, I know I may not be starting Jordan Matthews in week 16 in the fantasy championship because God forbid you play your fantasy championship in week 17. I may not be playing Jordan Matthews in week 16 at all. Maybe I may have long gotten rid of him, but in those first four weeks, I will certainly take a chance on Jordan Matthews as a what the heck flex. I'm going to throw him in. Hey, spoiler alert, our week one preview on the audible I'm going to have Jordan Matthews as a what the heck flex. He's getting drafted right now basically as a wide receiver six. So why not? You know, why not just throw it out there? Throw it on a team that you know can throw the ball, you know can get it out there and get it around with Tom Brady throwing it. Why not Jordan Matthews? So again, who do you trust? What's the information? What's the consistent drum beat? And at the end of your draft anyway, are you going to find the same sort of upside? And let's take the players around him, the players around him in average draft position right now. Uh, and some interesting players, certainly. Michael Gallup, rookie wide receiver for the Cowboys from CSU. Okay, cool. I've got more of the long view on Michael Gallup and certainly an up-close and personal view from you know Colorado State just right up the road in Fort Collins. I know Gallup's game very well. He is an acrobatic. There's a dash, a dash of A.J. Green to his game. But he's a rookie. And we've seen, you know, in recent history, uh, you rookies, you're going to take a little bit more time. And whether it's injury, Mike Williams, what have you, an opportunity, uh, you know, and injuries that you, you see take these rookie wide receivers off track. It's just, uh, okay, am I going to take Jordan Matthews in the 13th round or am I going to take Michael Gallup? I really like Michael Gallup. I'm still going to take Jordan Matthews. Uh, I look at. Tyrell Williams with the Chargers. Everyone falling all over themselves about the Chargers. Something always happens with the Chargers to screw it up for that team. So Tyrell Williams, nice speed asset for that team. Yeah, I'm still going to pick Jordan Matthews in the 13th round. You know, Mohamed Sanu, uh, Danny Amendola talking trash. Well, you know, whatever. Deshaun Jackson, interesting, right? Interesting names here. D.D. Westbrook, uh, Kenny Galladay who can dominate Josh Doxson, Geronimo Allison. So interesting names around where you see Jordan Matthews going. Who's got the best quarterback of all that situation. I'll do respect to Phillip rivers, but we all know it's Tom Brady. So give me Jordan Matthews as kind of that late round. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm going to listen to Mike Reese. I'm going to pay attention to what Mike Reese is reporting and what he is saying as well. So, that gives a little Jordan Matthews insight as we continue on here on the Audible Live. Cecil Lammy going solo today with uh, Dr. Gene already have checked in. Sigmund Bloom and Matt Waldman are on assignment. That means they're still on vacation. So we'll get the crew back together. Sigmund and I are going to start recording the preseason watch list, I believe, on Sunday is where we're going to start that. So before the first preseason game, we're going to have the preseason watch list released. 32 teams, 32 episodes, and every skill position player that you want to know about, we talk about on those shows. That is coming up on the Audible. Make sure to make it happen there. And uh, make sure to, to tune into those shows. And before week one of the preseason, we'll have all those shows uh, released. So I also want to get into the Green Bay backfield because of recent reports. I'm going to get to the Colts backfield in a little bit. Again, our man Daniel Simpkins from footballguys.com who went to the senior bowl this year. It was good to uh, see and hang out with Daniel. He's got a great article at footballguys.com about what's going to happen with the Colts backfield. So we're going to really get into that, but a couple of Packers notes. First and foremost, it is USA Today's Wisconsin's Stu Courtney 
that believes that Aaron Jones will end up as the team starting running back this season. Aaron Jones, the guy who a lot of people think, ah, oh, he's probably third, right? You know, leading up to this point. And certainly when we consider average draft position, it is Jamal Williams that gets taken first in fantasy leagues as fantasy owners are, are looking at that trio of backs. It's not just Jamal Williams and Aaron Jones, the two rookies last year, of course, Jones with the UTEP two-step and Williams from BYU, but also Ty Montgomery, the converted wide receiver there. So you have three backs in Green Bay. Fantasy owners are basically confused or split on which way this thing's going to go. We're going to have to watch this in training camp. But let's look at their skill sets and then look at what do the Packers need. The skill set for Jamal Williams. I love the guy is kind of a buddy of mine. I know him a little bit running him at the Super Bowl or and first met him at the Senior Bowl, met his family, his personal trainer, all those sorts of things. And I love Jamal Williams because he told me in Waldman, actually, um, I, I watch old film of Eric Dickerson and Walter Payton. And as sweetness is the greatest of all time, in my opinion, uh, my favorite player of all time is Walter Payton. When this young kid told me that, I was like, wow, he goes back and watches the old school, old school Eric Dickerson, old school Walter Payton. I love that about his game. I'm also, as regular listeners and viewers know, I love the power game. That's my style of football is the power game. Uh, I know that, you know, throw around a football, score a bunch of points. I'd rather just line up. We're going to run, you know, we're going to run. We're going to run it down your throat. You can't stop us going to impose our will on you. We're going to run and march down the field and we're going to kick your ass. That's my style of football. I love that style of football. So of course I'm eh, not necessarily biased, but I, I kind of like the style of Jamal Williams a little bit better than Aaron Jones, who is arguably the best all purpose back on that team's roster because he's a, a, a fine receiver. He is a, a fine runner, not the banger, not that smash mouth sort of runner, but a guy that's not afraid. He's, he's a bit of a slasher, in my opinion, uh, not afraid to run between the tackles. We see too many young backs maybe try to bounce things outside of the corner store. You don't necessarily see that with Jones. You see him have that intent inside, which is always something important that I watch for in, in, in young running backs. Well, then you look at uh, the situation with Ty Montgomery. He's the best receiver. He's a converted receiver, and he's the best run after the catch guy. So what do the Packers need? And there may be some of you out there saying, well, what you need is that guy and you're going to go fast break and it's Rogers going to be filling there with footballs. And I understand that that makes sense to me, but what are the Packers also going to do this year? They're going to play with a lead. What does playing with a lead dictate that you run the damn ball and that you perhaps use the banger. So right now I personally agree with average draft position and the average draft position for these three backs. I'm going to look at it right now. And, you know, ADP available at footballguys.com. Other places as well, but, you know, check out footballguys.com. Jamal Williams has the highest ADP at running back 36, 7, 11. Jones is right behind him at running back 41, 901 and 12 team PPR. And Ty Montgomery is running back 43 at 907. So from the end of the seventh round to the middle-ish, you got to throw in the ish, the middle-ish of the ninth round, you have three Packers running backs going. That means everybody's confused. That means everyone's kind of questioning which direction this thing's going to go. Well, you've got USA Today's Stu Courtney suggesting that it's going to be Aaron Jones to end up as the team starting running back. Now, it's important to note that in the article, he says end up as the team starting running back. That doesn't mean to begin the season as the starting running back. Jamal Williams, provided that he stays healthy, and all three of these guys, you know, Williams, that banger, he's going to take more punishment. Jones has had some injury things, a little banged up, and we know Ty Montgomery's been banged up as well. It opened the door for Jones and Williams there last year with the Packers. So right now, I personally agree with average draft position that Williams should be first. He seems the most likely. He's okay as a receiver, not that receiving threat, certainly that Montgomery is, and he's not as good a receiver as Aaron Jones. But when you talk about the two-down banger, and again, think of what the Packers need playing with a lead and also think of what your league needs. You know, this is a situation where you're going to bring in a pass catching back and that may be, it's maybe Jones, maybe Montgomery. So they may be competing for uh, some sort of reserve or change of pace role, not competing to be the primary ball carrier, 
the way that Jamal Williams is in 2018. The Audible Live, I am Cecil Lammy, your host tonight with our guys, um, <laughs> with our guys on assignment and on vacation. So here's what you need to go to do. Go to footballguys.com, sign up for our free daily newsletter, and you're going to check out all the stories with views and insights from yours truly, Sigmund Bloom. And Andrew Garda also checks in on the Newswire uh, for us as well. So check out our Newswire, check out our free daily newsletter, and of course, just subscribe to footballguys.com. We appreciate you guys for doing that, for supporting the show right here um, on this program, on the Audible, and on Football Guys TV. So... Randall Cobb, the other Packers note that I wanted to get to tonight is that he's out of a boot. Remember a few weeks ago, it was before vacation here on the Audible, where we had had the mysterious, like, Randall Cobb, Cobb is all of a sudden in a boot. Like, that isn't good. Uh, was out of the boot now, expects to be ready for training camp. And Cobb says he it wasn't known if he would have any limitations yet. So before you rush out there and go, I'm going to go stock up on Geronimo Allison and all of my leagues. Well, uh, okay, hold on a, a little bit. With Jordy Nelson playing for the Raiders, we know that there's going to be more there for Geronimo Allison, a guy much like my Nate Sudfeld take. I think it was the same year off the top of my head where Geronimo Allison was there with those big soft hands. Reminded me of uh, Jerome Simpson or years ago, uh, who was also a Shrine Game participant with those big hands that just kind of, there's this sound it makes uh, where it's just like flip. It's almost like uh, Spider-Man's webs coming out or something like that. Like the sound that you make when you have those large, strong hands like Geronimo Allison, like Jerome Simpson back in the day. Uh, that was always something of note for Allison back at that game. He's interesting. And then look at the the young kids behind him. Jamon Moore, Equinemius St. Brown, greatest name, the uh, Black Eyed Joe all-name team right there, and Marquez Valdez-Scantling. So look at those three guys behind him, the rookies, and go, what do they have in common? Oh, they're all larger receivers there as well. So before you start gathering stock on these other players, not named Devontae Adams or Randall Cobb, let's watch this situation. Now, if you look at where he's at, you know, look at what everyone else thinks of Randall Cobb right now. Wide receiver, 35. 802 in current 12 team PPR leagues, right in front of Devin Funches and Cooper Cup and Robert Woods, right after Jamison Crowder and Emmanuel Sanders. I could easily, easily make the argument that Cobb is much more valuable than Emmanuel Sanders. I had that question uh, earlier tonight on Twitter. I believe I answered that question about, oh, what do you think about Demarius and Emmanuel Sanders? And I know it's a Broncos show, but with Broncos training camp coming up in nine days, it's on my mind. I really think Sanders could be hurt a lot by Cortland Sutton. I mean, a lot. So, you know, Sanders as a wide receiver three. Yeah, I'll let someone else take him. Because right before, and this goes into the Randall Cobb situation, look at these wide receivers in the 30s. Okay, so you have Julian Edelman at wide receiver three, uh, 30, 609, 12 team PPR. Of course, you're going to miss time with him, but whatever. Suspensions don't necessarily scare me. Will Fuller is there. Very interesting. Uh, Pierre Garçon. I would way rather have Pierre Garçon at wide receiver 32 than I would Emmanuel Sanders. I would way rather have Jamison Crowder, who's right behind Emmanuel Sanders at wide receiver 34. I would way rather have Randall Cobb than Emmanuel Sanders. You get my point. Cooper Cup. Rather have Cooper Cup than Emmanuel Sanders. I'd rather have old man Jordy Nelson, who's at wide receiver 40. So, you know, let's, let's talk about what's going on currently. The Broncos have two you know, seemingly fantastic rookie was wide receivers, Cortland Sutton catching everything, mossing people out there. That's the term that's being thrown around about Cortland Sutton. Don't get too excited, but just know the big man is coming through in practice. We know that he's had some concentration problems from his days at SMU, but Cortland Sutton getting it done. Uh, certainly exciting. You know, if we talk about preseason hype, who are you most excited about? Well, I'm excited about Cortland Sutton. And it really pumps the break on Emmanuel Sanders. With Randall Cobb, with this boot, thing as long as he's out of the boot and everything's good there and he's performing eventually in the preseason let's say week three he's able to get some time in the preseason i'll feel fine about taking randall cobb in the seventh or eighth round i'll feel fine taking randall cobb before emmanuel sanders um you know before devin funches uh before robert woods before Devonte parker guys like that i would feel good about randall cobb 
in those aspects, we're just going to have to wait and see uh, in this situation. It sounds like something was minor. It sounds like they dealt with it quickly and swiftly, put them in a boot almost immediately. Again, it's kind of a little bit mysterious, which does make me nervous. Uh, it is a little bit mysterious there with Randall Cobb, but he's out of the walking boot. And the report coming out today, and this was from wbay.com, is that Randall Cobb spotted without walking boot during his football camp. So there you go. There's the latest on the Green Bay Packers. Talked a little bit of the running back situation. Talked about Randall Cobb and the wide receiver situation as well. The Audible Live each and every Thursday night, eh, except for when we're on vacation. <laughs> Last two weeks. Uh, appreciate everyone for listening and uh, just participating in the show. You guys reaching out like, when's the show coming back? Like, man alive, it's been since 2006 we've been doing this show. And to have the community that we've built and the way that we've built it and the fact that we can all come together for fantasy football. And we can all come together and share insights and opinions. Um, that on a I don't know meta note, there's a lot of stuff out there that sucks right now. I mean, just sucks. Sucks to interact with people on Facebook. Sucks to interact with some people on Twitter. Like everyone's like hyper politicized about everything. I don't want to talk about any of that crap. I just want to talk about football and to have the audience with you guys to be able to do that. We need our distractions. Like when there's, when politics are sprinkled through everything, you can't escape it. It's not healthy. Uh, it's like a, a pressure cooker, right? You need to release the steam. We as a society need to release the steam. And we do that through sports. Sports are supposed to be fun. Look at, I don't even like uh, baseball that much. I want to soften the blow a little bit for you big baseball fans out there. I'm not a big baseball fan. I love the all-star game and the home run derby like that. I like just take my mind off the heavy stuff that's going on. That's what fantasy football does. That's what football does. And yeah, it's a distraction. And there are way more important things, like real live things that are going on in this world that are not sports because sports are the distraction. But you know what? We need the distraction. I'll, I'll pull back the curtain a little bit as I rant here. Years ago, when we had started the Audible and we'd got some traction, you know, I remember the first year, we had like a million downloads and I think we were over, we were about 16 million downloads last year. So again, thank you guys um, for listening to the show. But I remember talking to Sigmund and, and it was like, you know, I, I love this. I love this interaction with the podcast and everything, but I, I you know, I, I want to help people. I have that urge and that uh, desire or instinct to, to help people, you know, whether it's a smile or a kind gesture, what have you. And Sigmund told me, and I've learned so much from Sigmund and we are, very opposite in a lot of our beliefs. Again, another reason why it's great to do this show because you have two guys that are pretty opposite in a lot of things that get together like brothers and 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 get along like brothers. Why? Because we all we all want the same thing. Anyway, Sigmund told me years ago, he said, you know what, Cecil, we do help people. We help people because they're, you know, in the hospital. And we've gotten the emails from guys that are going through like chemo and stuff, or, or their children are going through chemo. And it's like, hey, your show helped me. And I'm like, oh my God. First off, um, I'm thinking about you. I'm sending those positive vibes, sending yes, thoughts and prayers. I'm sending that your way. Um, because that's real life. That's the heavy stuff. Um, so when Sigmund told me that, he's like, We we do help people, you know, because you know, help them with the interaction in the chat room and all, all that kind of stuff. So again, I'm just taking time out to say. Thank you, guys. we got the regular season coming up. It's going to be nine episodes a week. You know the drill by this time on the Audible. You know what we do. And you know, we're going to get about 250 shows this year. And we appreciate each and every one of you. It, it, we can't say it enough. We don't have this without you guys. You know, We're not able to have this without you guys. It's your energy and love that drive us. So again, thank you. Thank you very much. So there you go. As I take a little break and a little breather, we'll get back to the chat room. We get back to your questions now here in the chat room. And this one from Michael, he says he just traded away McKinnon and Crowder for Julio on half PPR with big bonus points. His other running backs are Zeke Mixon and Sony Michelle. Other wide receivers are Allen Robinson, Emmanuel Sanders, and Corey Davis. So he gets that bump up in Julio. And Jarek McKinnon is a very interesting player to consider in his own right because you're all thinking well Shanahan back right uh, look at what he did last year look at what he can do this year and look at how he's drawn 
perhaps the most off-season buzz for a player who last year in the 51 catches are significant. And he's going to do that again this year. If you put the number at 60 or 65 catches, I'm not going to be surprised at all for Jarek McKinnon, but you're not going to get a thousand yards rushing. Most likely not going to do that, but this is a guy that's caught fire in his average draft position and is something where, okay, you're giving up an asset, but you're getting a great asset. You're getting Julio Jones in return. It is a hefty price tag, especially with this Julio situation uh, going on. But right now, McKinnon is stuck at running back 13. So just outside the running back one ranks, I always think of 12 team leagues. So if I'm saying 13, it is, you know, a, a running back two, basically. But average draft position behind Devonta Freeman, behind Christian McCaffrey, ahead of Joe Mixon and Jordan Howard there as well. And then, you know, LaShawn McCoy's average draft position taking that big tumble right now at running back 16, 307, because you just don't know what in the hell is going to go on there. Uh, in that situation. So Jarek McKinnon, am I buying or selling the stock right now? It's a little bit rich for me, honestly, if I'm going to take a chance on that type of player who is in the right system, who is a very capable pass catcher. And again, these are PPR leagues, but he's going around the same time that Devonta Freeman is. He's going around the same time that Christian McCaffrey is. I would take a chance on those two ahead of McKinnon, anyone behind McKinnon, Let's say Darius Geis, um, not feeling that as much. Uh, Derrick Henry, not feeling that as much. Jordan Howard is is interesting and certainly productive with the heavy workload. We know that he said he's you know trying to work on his hands and get better and all that sort of things. But they're going to use a committee. They're going to use the Matt Nagy. Is it Nagy or Nagy? Does anybody ever know? Because I've heard both. I, I've heard from people that work for the Chiefs like it was Nagy. And then on NFL Network, I'm watching it and they're like, ah, oh, Matt Nagy. Like, oh, who the hell knows? Um, the new coach of the Bears, how about that, is going to use multiple backs. So that that uh, hurts Jordan Howard's stock. So while Devonta Freeman, Chris McCaffrey, maybe Dalvin Cook, if he's there, he shouldn't be there. But if he's around that mid-second round range uh, and Jarek McKinnon's on the board, I'm going to take those three ahead of Jarek McKinnon uh, 10 times out of 10. So not down on McKinnon but just maybe not as hyped as some people certainly are uh, for the 2018 season. We're going to see how it works out for San Francisco. It is very exciting there as well. Looking at some of the other latest news from around the National Football League, uh, the Julio Jones thing, of course, and Joe Flacco. By the way, just coming across the wire, John Watson said he's a full go when training camp begins. So great, awesome. Now go out there and save Bill O'Brien's job. You know the guy that didn't want you? Yeah, Bill O'Brien, that guy, that was a Rick Smith pick, by the way. I don't know if I should pull the curtain back that much, but that was Rick Smith standing on the table and getting to Sean Watson, even though Bill O'Brien didn't want him. And now Rick Smith's gone and Bill O'Brien had his job saved by Deshaun Watson. So, hey, Bill, uh, maybe you better use him right this year instead of not giving him first team reps in the preseason last year. Anyway, not a big Bill O'Brien fan. That's just me. Going across the wire, though. And again, footballguys.com, where you want to be, uh, and looking at some of the stories that we're writing about and commenting on. I did have some thoughts on the Ravens wide receivers because you get to a certain point in every draft and you're like, okay, the, the top teams, the top passing teams have been picked through. I'm very curious about what the Ravens are going to do with their wide receivers, with Joe Flacco having Lamar Jackson behind him. Whether or not he likes that or not, you hear some rumblings like it's it's definitely motivated him. You hear some rumblings like maybe he's not the biggest fan of having that first round quarterback sitting behind him. Uh, Flacco, the writing's on the wall. You know, get it done or this team could move on to Jackson in the near future. So you get it done with a new wide receiver core. And right now, let's look at the average draft position of Michael Crabtree. We know that's his primary target. John Brown, you know, loves smoke. I love that first all or nothing. By the way, I know everyone's excited about, oh, hard knocks. All or nothing makes hard knocks look like a vine. I, I mean, it's it's the entire season. So, of course, the all or nothing about the Cardinals, the first all or nothing a couple of years ago, where Bruce Arians was calling John Brown Smoke. Well, his other name was mf -er, but <laughs> Smoke was his nickname. Like, of course, I love John Brown. I love Smoke. Willie Sneed, I appreciate the hair game of Willie Sneed, but it's really about Michael Crabtree to me as that security blanket. He is almost, 
he's like Anquan Bolton and Dennis Pitta wrapped into one for Joe Flacco. Flacco just sees him on the route in the in in the concept, and he's just like, "There's my security blanket." I love. It. He's like Linus. Flacco's like Linus out there. Just needs a security blanket. That's why there's a peanuts reference for all you old guys like me out there. But Michael Crabtree's current average draft position is wide receiver 28. It's at 605, so the mid range of the sixth round. It's in front of Sammy Watkins, right in front of Sammy Watkins. And I know I've got friends that work for the Chiefs, and the reports on Sammy Watkins have been outstanding. Just like the connection with Pat Mahomes, they're vibing, they're on the same page, all these sorts of things. But then I look at Kareem Hunt. I look at Tyreek Hill, I look at Travis Kelsey, I look at Sammy Watkins having an injury history so long it reads like infinite jest, DFW, this is water. Uh, yeah, I'm not buying into Sammy Watkins there. I'm taking Michael Crabtree. Corey Davis goes at wide receiver 27, 602, right in front of Michael Crabtree. Uh, okay, that's interesting with the Titans and, and Marcus Mariota, and we'll see how the you know the new coaching staff approaches things with that passing game. And we know that Corey Davis is a very talented receiver in his own right, natural physical skill set. I'd rather take Crabtree there. And and again, y'all listen to the show. You know, I'm not a Ravens fan. I hate the Ravens. You kidding me? I don't want the Ravens to be successful whatsoever. But I'm thinking, okay, what does Joe Flacco love? Security blankets. Anquan Bolden. Uh, Dennis Pitta, he loves security blankets. Who is the ultimate security blanket in that wide receiver position? It's not John Brown. It's not Willie Sneed. It's not Chris Moore, Mr. Nine Route. That's all you should call Chris Moore. And at this point, it's not, you know, either Hayden Hurst or Mandrew, Mark Andrews there. Uh, their rookie tight ends are very, very exciting for that Baltimore Ravens team. If he's going to move the chains, if he's really inspired, he's going to use Michael Crabtree early and often. And where he's going right now, whereas Chris Hogan's going in front of Michael Crabtree, that's more of a push for me. Marvin Jones, I'd prefer Marvin Jones to Crabtree. Just a little more exciting, uh, dynamic, if you will. But Crabtree's a wide receiver three with clear wide receiver two upside. And if Michael Crabtree finished as a top 15 fantasy wide receiver, if you're pessimistic, say top 20, he's getting drafted right now at wide receiver 28. So guys that are those safe and consistent players. I still love Pierre Garçon. I was big on Pierre Garçon last year. Y'all remember that he gets hurt. That stung. <laughs> that took a little bit off there, but I'm still bullish and bold on Pierre Garçon. Garçon's going at wide receiver 32 Crabtree at wide receiver 28. It's about the same situation. I uh, got a better quarterback in San Francisco and Jimmy G. Uh, but Crabtree there. In front of Sammy Watkins, yes, of course. Julian Edelman with the four-game suspension. How do you feel about suspensions? You're going to take him, you're going to take Crabtree, make your decision. But if you're saying, okay, there's Emmanuel Sanders, there's Pierre Garçon, there's Corey Davis, there's Sammy Watkins, and there's Michael Crabtree, I'm saying Michael Crabtree is my number one pick out of those wide receivers. So watch where things are kind of falling right now. There's a certain... I don't want to say ignorance, but there's some blind spots out there that you can take advantage of. Now, once the preseason begins and let's say Michael Crabtree in week three of the preseason has, you know, three catches, two touchdowns for, for 110 yards, whatever the number is, you're not going to get Michael Crabtree at wide receiver 28. So you kind of want to, you know, keep that thing down a little bit. And it's not that Crabtree is some sort of out of nowhere surprise, but I think people are ignoring him right now. And I don't think people should based on what Joe Flacco likes and who Michael Crabtree just is. No matter who his quarterback's been, he's always been a security blanket. That is a wrap for tonight's program. Many thanks to everyone. I do want to put this out there and check out the Audible. Check out, uh, uh, of course, us on iTunes. I guess we're going to get on Spotify. I don't know. Um, you know, what, however you listen to the show, we appreciate you guys for doing that and watching here on our YouTube channel and our our subscriptions there have just grown and grown and we don't hardly promote this YouTube channel whatsoever. So appreciate the fact that we got over 5,000 people subscribed to the channel right now. I do want to say this just to put it out there um, for any of our football guys that are listening here. I'm doing a fantasy football draft party. It's in Denver. So you have to come out to Denver, but if you come out to Denver and if you're the furthest to travel to Denver for my fantasy football draft party, 
which you can check out at 1043thefan.com slash fantasy. If you're the furthest to travel to come see me at my fantasy party, I'll buy you a Football Guys subscription. I will buy you a Football Guys subscription if you are the furthest person to travel. So I'm expecting about 500 people at this party. Uh, check out and get your tickets, 1043thefan.com slash fantasy. But yeah, let's let's uh, let's put that out there. I want to see who uh, you know kind of wants to see the audible in action. And uh, Sigmund, unfortunately, is not going to be able to make it to this party, but uh, may have a surprise or two in line for you there as well. So again, just putting it out there, <laughs> just putting it out there. Uh, and we thank you guys uh, all the time. TSM, you, TSU, MZ24 saying uh, thanks. Tim MC saying thanks. I appreciate you guys and appreciate you guys. Let me rant <laughs> for a little bit. Let's all just take care of each other and let's enjoy sports and let's enjoy life. And let's get this thing done the right way. So for the great Dr. Gene Bramble and Sigmund Bloom and Matt Waldman vacationing, I know they're having a great time. I'm Cecil Lammy saying thank you all. Stay tuned and stay frosty.